Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Alex Spigos. And I'm Kenya Robinson. Plugged In is the product of the Schieffer Journalism Camp at TCU. The stories featured here were written and produced by 10 high school students from across the country. It's a new kind of learning and it's happening right here at Reese Jones Hall on TCU's campus. Corinne Hildebrand has more on the new style of learning. Active learning is a new style of teaching that focuses on the interaction between students and their work. If you can engage the material and are forced to engage it, then you're more, much more likely to come to terms with it and understand it. Reese Jones is the newest academic building on campus and it is unlike any other academic building. That the space is very flexible. Where there are no seats that are anchored to the floor, where all four walls of the classroom, unless they've got windows in them, are involved as pedagog pedagogical surfaces. So you can write on all the walls. Reese Jones has around 14,500 feet of writable wall space for students. They really love the writable walls. And we started with just one writable wall in the study rooms. And then they sent pictures to the provost. And eventually he decided to have them all painted. So they can write on the walls or the glass walls. So they have 360 degrees to write. Um, it's mainly the whiteboard stuff. I'm pre-med. And so I have lots of chemistry and I'm doing physics right now stuff and that's a lot of writing out equations, big problems, lots of variables, so it's nice to be able to just spread all that out on a giant whiteboard. And Students and teachers say the new technology in Reese Jones makes it easier to interact with each other and the material. And they love AirMedia because they can project their laptops to the computer in the, in the study rooms as well. We put our business processes up on here so we can look at them while we're studying. Um, we can pull up different videos of how to do certain math problems and stuff like that. Provost Donovan says the active learning movement has made the students more motivated to learn. They want to participate and to some extent control arguments. It allows us, for example, to move the tables around, to create space for discussion. Howard says the space in Reese Jones and the active learning environment provides the students with the opportunity to utilize those interactive elements. Corinne Hildebrandt, South Elgin High School. After a successful academic year in Reese Jones, the staff is looking forward to making a positive changes to better meet the TCU needs. When students return to campus next fall, they won't see the same library they saw last year. Here's Javier Velasquez with more details on the Mary Couts Burnett Library. Construction of Mary Couts Burnett Library began in late 2014 and will have emphasis on community space. The space will be highlighted by two sky bridges that will connect the library and the newly constructed Reese Jones Hall. In many cases, by night, there'll be portion, portions of that building that can be used. The library during the long semesters is open 24 hours, so that students, depending upon their own work habits, may want to start at midnight working on a project. Other people start in the morning, some people start in the afternoon, so it's making more of the resources of campus available. As a part of the Academy of Tomorrow movement, the library will have a virtual shelf browsing feature a technology-enhanced environment and be focused on community space. Uh, TCU has always provided us with the upper-scale learning, so we're very blessed with that. Um, I think it will benefit. Despite the annoyances of construction noise, students are looking forward to the new library. Uh, when the fall comes and the library opens, it's going to be about, I mean, just so much more space, so much better to use for us, so it's a necessary evil at this point. Javier Velasquez, South Grand Prairie High School. Construction on the library is set to be completed in August before the fall semester. TCU students and faculty will have a new look to their email this Thursday. Students and staff will not lose any of their data, but specific actions must be taken to activate their new email. The new email system, Office 365, includes many features that some say will improve multitasking. The IT Support Help Desk will be available to assist students and staff throughout the transition. For more information, visit TCU360.com. Social media is changing the state of journalism. Kenya Robinson shows us how it is giving reporters a new way to reach their audience and share breaking news. Popular social media sites like Twitter and Facebook continue to transform the world of journalism. Many journalists in the United States use social media to promote themselves and to share their news stories. More than half of U.S. journalists use social media to gather information for reporting stories. More than 70% use social media to keep track of competition and reports of breaking news. Fox 4 producer Lexi Cruz came to speak to high school students during a workshop at TCU. Cruz shared her experiences as a journalist with the students. How has social media changed the face of journalism? 
on social media, you can follow and get information and stories that you want. So it's really catered to you. Um, and I think that's what people do now. So you just kind of have to find your audience and make sure that your audience can find you too. Star Telegram columnist Bud Kennedy also came to speak to the students at the workshop. He is an early adopter of social media. Kennedy joined Twitter in 2008. He made another Twitter account in 2009 that focused on his reviews of local restaurants. So it's a research tool for us. It's a way at uh, breaking news scenes of finding other people who are connected to that story, who might even be quoted, that you can quote in the story. And, you know, it, it's a way to find facts, it's a way to find uh, sources, it's, it's a way to find readers. KJ Robinson, South Grand Prairie High School. Social media continues to play a huge role in how people receive news. In the journalism field, women have always typically been outnumbered by men. Despite this imbalance, there are more notable female journalists today than ever before. Victor Rodriguez has more on the role of women in the field of journalism today. Looking at the numbers, journalism has always been a field predominantly run by men. Since 1999, newsrooms have remained at around 63% male to about 37% female, according to the American Society of News Editors. A study performed by Gender Report shows that there are typically far more male news bylines than female bylines, the most dramatic example being the Texas Tribune. In the past, this has been a hurdle for women journalists to overcome when trying to make a name for themselves, since women have been given fewer opportunities than men. We spoke to NBC5 anchor Deborah Ferguson about her thoughts on the role of women in the newsroom. You know, back then, the boss in the newsroom, the number one boss in the newsroom, the number two boss in the newsroom, the number three boss in the newsroom, they were men. Mm -hmm. Now, in the newsroom, our number one boss, our number two boss, women. women. Women lead our shop. Within the broad field of journalism, sports journalism has seen the largest imbalance of men to women. Veteran NFL writer Shereen Williams talked to us about some of the things she's encountered throughout her career. According to Williams, in the beginning of her career, there were times she would leave football games without having the chance to speak to athletes because she was not a male reporter and wasn't allowed into the locker room after games. Williams has been an NFL writer for 22 years and has been around to see the changes in the way women sports reporters are treated. But I will say uh, the NFL has been very, very good to women uh, and has made things fair as far as everyone going to the locker room and made it clear to the guys that this is the way you're going to act. You're going to act professionally. And they do. I, I've never had a problem uh, since I've been covering the Cowboys in 1999. I've never had a problem in that locker room. Williams has been an NFL writer for 22 years and has been around to see the changes in the way women's sports reporters are treated. Although women are still outnumbered by men in the journalism field, there has been a steady rise in notable female journalists. Victor Rodriguez, The Design and Technology Academy. Studies done by the Gender Report show that although women are in minority in journalism, the United States has more female journalists than any other country. The Frogs' journey in Omaha has come to an end. TCU beat LSU in both games they played against the Tigers, but couldn't pull through in either game versus Vanderbilt. The Frogs look strong in their first game in this year's College World Series against LSU, winning 10-3 with a stunning performance from their pitching staff. The baseball team's season, however, ended Friday as the Frogs fell to the Commodores 7-1. TCU now has another title to add to the trophy case. At the 2015 NCAA Track and Field Indoor Championships, TCU earned its 20th national title in the men's 4x1. The Horned Frogs also competed in seven other events in the Outdoor Championships. On Thursday, TCU will head to the 2015 USA Track and Field Junior Outdoor Championships. The TCU women's basketball team is looking forward to playing in a newly renovated Daniel Meyer Coliseum. Ann Norton talked with the players who say they are hoping to bring the energy that helped fuel their success last season into their new home. TCU women's basketball players say they are excited to bring the new energy they had in the rec center last season into the newly renovated Daniel Meyer Coliseum. TCU women's basketball went 9-9 nine and nine in conference play this past season. Senior Caitlin Diaz says the small space gave the team an advantage. Well, it just seemed like there was a lot more people in there just because it was so compact and stuff. It was kind of like a smaller gym, so 
I don't know if there was actually more fans, but it felt like there was more fans and it was like super loud in there and it gave us like an advantage, a really good advantage. But I think overall, I feel like it was like our good luck charm playing there because we had just such a home court advantage being in such a small place like that and having all our fans close. Hamilton says she thinks the renovations with seats closer to the court will help with the new atmosphere in the Coliseum. Yeah, I think it'll, it'll definitely be similar to have people close that you can hear screaming for you and, you know, cheering you on. The transition from the rec back into the Coliseum will be different, but Dia says the team is excited for this transition. I hope that all the fans from there would come and see us play in here. I think they will actually since we had such a good fan base in there. Um, I think they'll actually come and watch us in the new arena. Ann Norton, Cassidy High School. The women's basketball team is scheduled to play their first game in the new Coliseum this November. The new Daniel Meyer Coliseum is scheduled to open in October, right before the basketball season begins. Ross Bailey says the $45 million renovation has been delayed due to the amount of rain at the beginning of the summer. Construction workers are now working around the clock and most Saturdays and Sundays to get the job done. After the break, we will discuss how TCU is helping first year students for the upcoming school year. And we will reveal the truth behind the beloved Horned Frog at TCU. Look around you. This is what opportunity looks like for the dreamers, the doers, for those who exceed expectations. The path you follow is the one you make for yourself. We share these experiences. We share these possibilities. What you take from here will stay with you, always. Opportunity is waiting. Let's get started. Welcome back. The TCU Admission Office anticipates the incoming class of 2019 to have a record number of students enrolled, says the Dean of Admission, Ray Brown. While the enrollment number will not be finalized until the fall, TCU is expecting about 200 more students than they originally planned. Brown says he thinks as TCU gets more attention to football, the student interest in TCU will only continue to rise. Another school year is quickly approaching and high school students are getting ready to apply for college. John Potterbaum talked with admissions to hear their suggestions for the application process. High school seniors agonize over the college application process. Since the college decision is so life-altering, students pigeonhole themselves into believing their application needs to be spotless. Those applying to TCU are no different. Dean of Admissions Ray Brown offers his best advice on how to alleviate the pressure, such as maintaining your strength of schedule throughout your senior year. If you're looking at a selective, and certainly highly selective schools, you want this kind of trajectory. Just Well, actually, you want this kind of trajectory. You want toughest courses every year and straight A's every year. But failing that, this is what you want. You don't want to go this way. Bad news. Application deadlines are important to track. Early action and the binding early decision are November 1st, with early action 2 coming January 1st and final deadline February 15th. Apply early. Uh, this year we had probably, I don't know, maybe 20 valedictorians who did not apply early, who applied in our final reading period, who didn't get in. There are several other small short answer essays that students oftentimes will pay next to no attention to. So you've got this one really cleaned up major essay and then oh yeah over here are these two or three other little short essays and I don't know let's just hammer something out real quick on these right. and so students don't pay enough attention to those kinds of things. That's, John Potterbaum, Westminster one. Christian Academy. In, as I... These tips that Dean Brown suggested can be used for those applying to college next year. A new sandwich shop is coming to the strip on University Drive in three weeks. Jimmy John's is replacing Cold Stone Creamery. The restaurant will be accepting frog bucks and campus cash and will deliver to students and residents nearby. The franchise owner says they are looking to hire TCU students. They will start processing applications in the next three days. Many first year students are here at TCU this week as a part of their first year experience. Adele Edwards has the inside look. With the new school year just around the corner, TCU is doing a lot to welcome incoming students to campus. TCU offers many programs and activities to help students with the transition to college. Orientation um, helps transition students to academics at TCU. Frog Camp is more of the social, kind of out of the classroom side of college, and then Connections and Frogs First both take place when a student gets on campus. 
Lindsay Knight, the assistant director of the first year experience at TCU, works with students to help them get used to college academics and meet with faculty. Knight says the first six weeks on a college campus are the most crucial in terms of students finding where they belong. We are a team of professionals who believe that every student coming to TCU comes here with high potential. What they do, who they meet, and how they think determine what we become as an institution um, and what we become as a campus culture. The First Year Experience, or FYE, provides students with the opportunity to meet with professors in their major, learn about the registration process, and help them become comfortable with staying on campus. So we start that in uh, the summer before students even get to campus and enroll in classes with orientation and frog camp, and they're all kind of a pieces of this big first year experience puzzle. Martin says it's better for students to come to college with an open mind and to not stay with the same friend group. I really liked orientation. Um, it was really fun to kind of see what your class is going to be like and meet new people and see how there's people from everywhere and everybody's different and how it's just it was just really fun. Besides academics, members of FYE say it focuses on creating a community within the campus and encourages first-year students to reach out of their comfort zone. Adele Edwards, Joshua High School. Students continue to make new friends and enjoy campus life thanks to the first-year experience. Incoming first-year students who go Greek will have some habits to break before going to their first college formal. Sophomore Delta Gamma member Sarah Booth says, High school dances were a much bigger deal. There was a big focus on embellishment, which is not the case when coming to college. This fall, TCU's Greek life will be welcoming a new fraternity, Sigma Nu. Sigma Nu is the only fraternity founded in strong opposition of hazing. Alex Taylor, the Sigma Nu Director of Expansion and Recruitment, says their goal is to build one of the nation's very best fraternity chapters, reflective of the mission shared by TCU and Sigma Nu, to develop ethical leaders for the world. When you step foot on TCU's campus, one of the first things you may notice is the way women dress. Casey Kelly spoke with students about their definition of TCU's style. Incoming TCU students have to think about more than just classes in a new home, but also how they'll dress when they get there. Sometimes it's easier to tell where people are from depending on what they're wearing. Like sometimes the California girls get a little more dressed up, and sometimes the Texas girls or the Southern girls are a little more dressed down. But when it gets cold, it's just a free-for-all of how many layers you own because no one's ready for it, and it happens really fast. Spark says this defines the TCU style, easy and comfortable. Everybody here seems to, to dress in a pretty preppy style, but then it also has the sort of uh, southwestern trend to it as well. The kind of more laid back, but still like the, the boots and all of that kind of thing, I really like. I still don't get the whole Texas style with like the big t-shirts. I don't know that yet, but I need to do that. Most of the time it's like leggings and tennis shoes and t-shirts. Sparks says that the TCU style is whatever is most comfortable to the student. Casey Kelly, Santa Fe Christian High School. Incoming students also say they have one less thing to worry about with the easy, comfortable TCU style. The Trinity Shakespeare Festival is on TCU's campus in the Bushman and Hayes theaters of Ed Landreth Hall. The production includes professional and student actors. Tickets are $25 for adults and $20 for seniors, TCU students, and staff. The last shows are on June 28th. Playgoers have the option to see Love's Labor's Lost or King Lear. A comedy or a tragedy. With TCU's latest trend of campus additions, the sundial was completed earlier this spring. With it being kept a secret until its revealing, Alex Figos shed, sheds light on the mystery behind the new sundial. If you're strolling down University Drive, you might notice the new addition outside Walsh Performing Arts Center, the TCU sundial. The, the man who donated this um, sundial is he's an, actually um, an alum from Notre Dame. He engaged a man called Will Andrews, and he's the world authority on sundials. The sundial is made from a black rock called Gabbro that the maker Andrews chipped away, showing the white surface. Andrews is the creator of all the longitude dials in the world. He designed this Notre Dame sundial, and um, his wife happened to be a Horn Frog alumni, and she said, it's a pity you can't do something for my university, you've done something for yours. He thought about it and he thought, yeah, I can do something for TCU. This dial took more than a year to construct and was kept a mystery to TCU students. After the construction, the sundial was finally unveiled on May 5, 2015. 
What I have noticed is that students like to have their photographs taken by it. Um, they look at it and puzzle about it, but I'm not sure they really understand it yet. Sunday, June 21st, marked the summer solstice. TCU geography instructor Jeffrey Rowett talked about how the sundial can be used. This wire is, uh, or stick uh, is called a gnomon, and the sun throws a shadow down on the sundial. The sun rises, of course, in the east and sets in the west, and as the day progresses, the sun moves across the sky in a giant parabola. And as the sun moves in that parabola, the shadow on the sundial changes, and that way you could tell time. Alex Figos, Lake Forest High School. Rowett says the sundial won't have to be recalibrated for thousands of years. This means it is one of the most accurate clocks in the world. The sundial will continue to be a rare sight to be seen on TCU's campus for years to come. Many people connect the horned frog to TCU's mascot, the super frog. This small reptile was first introduced to campus in 1896, but many students never fully understood the reason why. Taylor Stiff has the truth on how the mascot was created. TCU's mascot history is often misunderstood and unknown to students due to the many rumors and tales of its creation. They tell you a little bit about it in the tours. I know it's really poisonous and spits blood out of its eyes, which is awesome, but I don't know anything more. The Horn Frog is not a mascot for other colleges and stuff, and so we're the only one that has the Horn Frog as our mascot. So I know that has to do partly with it, I think. Legends of TCU's mascot creation include Horn frogs covering a football field to choosing a yearbook theme. The real story of how TCU chose its unique mascot is actually not as interesting as one may think, says Dr. Don Mills. The true story is that Colby Hall, who was a, a student in the original class at TCU, in the 1890s he was the dean and they needed some nickname for their football team, which had been called the Fightin' Preacher Boys. Um, and he picked Horn Frog. They wanted it to be different. They did want something that represented Texas in the Southwest. And, and a Horn Frog, um, you know, it's, it's localized to the Southwest. It's a very unique creature. And so that's why they picked it. For its unique. There's actually a Horn Frog statue that we stopped by on our tour. But it's said that if you rub its nose before test or like admissions, that you have good luck. Um, so we encourage students to do that on their tours and also before tests and things like that. To me, it's special because we're the only university in the world to have it as our mascot. So when you see a horn frog, you immediately think TCU. Um, so I know there's a lot of other schools that have common mascots, and so for TCU, it's special to have the horn frog reserved just for TCUs. While legends and stories still spread throughout the campus, pride for the horn frog is sure to remain the same in years to come. Taylor Stiff, Coppell High School. Wow, I was starting to believe all those rumors. I know, I like the horned frog though, it's so Texas. <laughs> That's all we have for you today. For more information about Plugged In and the Schieffer's Journalism Camp, visit our website at tcjournalismworkshop.com. Thanks for watching, have a great day.